Another thing you might notice if you look at some phonetic transcriptions of some words or sentences is that we don't use punctuation when transcribing an IPA. When we transcribe phonetically, the normal rules of capitalization and punctuation don't apply. So we don't use periods, question marks, uppercase letters, or any of that. That's because the function of punctuation is to indicate things that we communicate in spoken English by changing our pronunciation, but which you can't see when words are written down. For example, we use commas where we typically would have a pause in speaking, and we use question marks where we would normally have a change in pitch when speaking to tell someone that it's a question. Instead of punctuation, we have special characters in IPA to indicate pauses, emphasis, and changes in pitch, and other things that punctuation is used to signal in written English. However, since we're transcribing exactly what is spoken, if a person doesn't produce a pause where there should be one, for example, then we don't write it down. We only write it down if it actually happens. Another thing that might seem strange is that we don't put spaces between words typically in phonetic transcription. That's because we don't actually pause between words in real speech, and sometimes sounds are shared across two words, like in the phrase, good dog. The problem here is that I only produced one D in good dog, and if I put a space between the words in my phonetic transcription, I would have to decide if that D belonged to good or dog, when really it belongs to both of them. The next couple slides have some transcription tips and notes about things that are different in the way we're going to write a couple of the symbols and the way that the book uses them. First, the website that I've listed at the top of this slide is a really good one for helping you learn the English phonemes and their symbols. For each symbol, it will show you the IPA transcription, play a recording of the sound in a word, and show you a video of a person saying the word. The first difference between how we will transcribe sounds and the way the book does it is that the book says to use the two E and I symbols for the A sound when the vowel is stressed, like in the words bake and baker, but to use the e, letter E alone when the vowel is unstressed, like in the word rebate. For now, we are doing phonemic or phoneme-only transcription. These two sounds are not contrastive in English, so we are going to use the same symbol, the letters E and I, for both the vowel in baker and the vowel in rebate. Similarly, unlike the book, we will use the two symbol OU version for the stressed vowel in boater and for the unstressed version of the vowel in OK. Later on, when we do narrow transcription, we may use these alternate versions of the letter E and the letter O alone, particularly for speech produced by learners of English as a second language. Like the book, however, we are going to use a different symbol for the stressed A uh sound, like in the word ba, than for the unstressed A uh sound, like the second vowel in the word sofa. Also, we will use a different symbol for the stressed er sound, like in bird, than for the unstressed er sound, like the second vowel in butter. So far, we've covered the material up through exercises 2.1, 2.2, and 2.5 through 2.7. If you haven't done these exercises yet, you should pause here or at the end of this recording and complete those exercises, and then check your answers with the key in the back of the book. If you're not getting the right answers, you need to review the reading, listen to the lecture again, or ask some questions by posting on the discussion board. The last topic in this lecture is about the linguistic description of words. Let's think about what it means to know a word. What knowledge do you need to have in your head to use that word correctly and to understand it when other people use it? Well, you need to know the meaning of the word and what it refers to. If you're going to write it, you need to know its spelling. You also need to know what sounds or phonemes the word is composed of so that you can recognize it when you hear it or so that you can pronounce it correctly. And you also have to know its grammatical function so that you can use it correctly in a sentence. All of this knowledge makes up part of what linguists call your linguistic competence or your knowledge about your language. 
Linguists try to identify and write down all of our knowledge about language. They've noticed how larger pieces of language can be broken down into smaller pieces. For example, the spelling of a written word can be broken down into smaller pieces called letters or graphemes. The pronunciation of a word can be broken down into different speech sounds or phonemes. Similarly, the meaning of a word can often be broken down into parts too. Each part has a separate meaning. For example, the word cats can be broken down into two meaning units. The first one is the base or main unit, cat, meaning the thing with four legs, fur, and whiskers that goes meow. And the second part is the S part, meaning more than one or plural. So to summarize, the distinctive letters that make up a word in its spelling are called graphemes. The distinctive sounds that make up a word in its pronunciation are called phonemes. And finally, the distinctive pieces of meaning that make up a word are called morphemes. So you might have noticed how this eem part of the word seems to mean the little distinctive pieces. So graph means writing, phone means sound, and morph means the word form. At this point, you could pause and complete exercises 2.3 and 2.4 in the book and check your work with the key in the back of the book. Again, if you're not getting the right answers, you should review the reading, this lecture, or post a question in the discussion board. Here's an exercise to try on your own. For each of the words in the quotation marks, try to find as many words as you can that share the same base morpheme and write them down. Remember, you're not doing a word search. It's not just about shared spelling. For two words to share the morpheme, you need to be able to show a connection between the root morpheme or base morpheme in all of the words. Sometimes it can be tricky. For example, decent and decency are definitely related, but I don't think decent and recent are related. However, I do think deduce and reduce are related, even though there's no word D-U-C-E or deuce that can stand on its own.